Welcome to episode 276 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Jonathan Johnny Grusing, who served in the FBI for 25 years. In this episode, Johnny reviews his investigation of former FBI informant and serial killer Scott Kimball, who may have murdered up to 20 or 50 people law enforcement may never know. Johnny worked with the Behavioral Analysis Unit, the BAU, and numerous law enforcement agencies to bring homicide charges against Kimball and recover three of his victims from remote mountainous areas in Colorado and Utah. The details of his murders are horrific, revealing his deception and complete disregard for human life, including family members he claimed to love. During Johnny Grusing's career, he worked violent crime to include bank robberies, kidnappings, missing persons, serial rapists, serial killings, and special jurisdiction homicides. In 2008, Johnny was named as the Denver Division's BAU coordinator. Consulting on difficult or unusual homicides or missing persons cases throughout the state. He is currently the Director of Safety and Security for the Douglas County School District in Colorado and is managing his own investigative consulting service. Johnny is writing a book about the time he spent with Scott Kimball investigating the serial murder case. At times, this episode is, well, really creepy, so I must issue a trigger warning especially for the second half when we talk about some really evil behavior. Now, before we get to the case review, I need to ask you a question. Are you still looking for Christmas stocking stuffers? How about a copy of FBI Word Search Puzzles? It's the perfect book for us to keep in our libraries to occupy our minds while we're taking care of business, (laughs) if you know what I mean. (laughs) I wrote it with my true crime-obsessed son, Chase. FBI Word Search Puzzles is available wherever paperback books are sold. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to a giveaway physical surveillance puzzle page from the book for all of you law enforcement, private investigators, and armchair detectives. All you need to do is print it and try it out. You'll also find links to where you can buy me a cup of coffee, join my reader team, and learn more about me and my other books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Jonathan Grusing. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? Great. Thanks for having me today. Well, I am so excited about this case review because everybody who listens to the podcast knows that I worked during most of my career, economic crime, frauds and con men. And I love listening to agents come on the show and talk about those type of cases. Then again, many listeners absolutely love listening to case reviews about serial killers. And this one, weirdly enough, is a con man who turned out to be a serial killer. He is. I think we can learn a lot from Mr. Kimball. He was, I would say, the epitome of both. Someone who enjoyed killing, but had made a life of conning people. And it seemed that the closer you got to Scott Kimball, the more you were conned. The most susceptible were those who had every reason to trust him, his family and his friends. And it would seem that he would steal more and more from you the closer you got. Well, I think that is kind of typical of many con men because as they get desperate and they go for the easy pickings and those are the people that trust them and believe what they're saying. One of the biggest people that were con was the FBI. Where do you want to start this case? I'm going to let you take control here. Where do you want to start? Yeah, I'll probably start, Jerry, of when I first got assigned this case, although for Denver Division, it it predated that by about three years. I was on a violent crime squad in Denver. I had been on the squad then for about eight years, and I had 
watched another violent crime agent who had 10 years seniority on me handle Scott, his name's Scott Kimball, as an informant. This started in about 2003, and Scott was in the federal prison. It's called FCI Inglewood. The other agent was operating him as an informant because Scott was telling the FBI that people on the outside were going to be killed. It's a, what we would call a murder for hire if the FBI did not intervene. The other agent was able to check and find that Scott had already been instrumental in supposedly saving the lives of a prosecutor and a judge in Alaska for the Anchorage FBI just months earlier. And now another murder for hire was being hatched out of Denver. And the Alaska agents were singing Scott's praises and what a lifesaver he was. So myself and a couple other agents were just kind of watching this unfold secondhand and just thinking how this Kimball guy, I got to meet him in June of 2003, I actually went and helped pay him. You have to have a witness pay an informant. And I was just along with the other agent to pay Scott Kimball, met him at a Starbucks, just seemed like your average guy, a little bit overweight, late 30s, early 40s, seemed pretty savvy, good talker. I'm just there along for the ride, met him for all of 15 minutes, and then would keep hearing tales that he's saving people's lives, yet he's very odd to deal with. He's manipulative. He seemed to be somewhat conning the agent, but the other agent had more experience than the rest of us. And we would just kind of talk around the squad area like, hmm, weird guy. But we all had our own cases. We were working. The violent crime squad's pretty busy. So you're running from bank robberies to kidnappings to fugitives. It's just something that's playing along in the margin. If you'd fast forward then to November 2006, I'm the only one in the squad area. And my boss calls me in and said, hey, Johnny, I've got something I want you to handle. He said, two dads came in and spoke with me. They think that our informant, the squad's informant, Scott Kimball, is involved in their daughter's disappearances and maybe even killed them. Sure enough, it's the same Scott Kimball that I had met three years ago. He said their story was very compelling because the one dad has been knocking on our door, his name's Bob, for three years, speaking to the agent who was handling Kimball and saying, I think your informant is responsible for my daughter Jennifer's death. The FBI was basically just saying, you know, this is an FBI case, you need to steer clear. The other dad, his name was Rob, so we actually had Rob and Bob that met each other. Rob had heard Bob speaking about his daughter Jennifer's disappearance and said, you know what, Scott Kimball was last with my daughter, Casey. Once these dads got together and pieced it that Scott was an FBI informant, Jennifer's dad, Bob, had confirmed that, they came and spoke to my boss. Scott Kimball, that day in November 2006, went from being an FBI informant. He was no longer active at that time. He was actually in jail in Montana for check fraud, but he was on our books still as basically an inactive informant, became the subject of two missing persons, and that quickly became more once I looked into the file. Looking into Scott's file, back then it was just a box of miscellaneous receipts and communications, FBI communications, and it was the murder for hire case. But Scott also had reported on other things besides Jennifer. Jennifer was the focal point. Her name's Jennifer Markham. She was the focal point on this murder for hire and that Scott's cellmate inside of FCI Inglewood was supposedly going to use Jennifer to kill people on the outside. Scott had teamed up with Jennifer to try to keep this from happening. So he was the good guy in this whole story. But when you look in the file, you see how, and again, it's like dust settling. It's really hard when you're in the middle of a case like this to see the forest from the trees. But Scott's story had changed from Jennifer helping him kill someone to actually Jennifer being killed. And that happened when Scott took a polygraph in late 2003. I saw the story changing as I'm thumbing through the file. I'm also seeing that Casey, Rob's daughter, is mentioned in there, but at the very end, that a detective from Lafayette, his name's Gary Thatcher, had said that he thinks Scott is involved in Casey's disappearance. It was an odd informant file to look through. Who was it that questioned him about the missing woman? Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, Jennifer had disappeared in February of 2003. Scott Kimball was released. He had actually got in jail for check fraud up in Alaska. 
he was stealing from a business called Fisherman's Finest. Scott was on a boat way out in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska under his brother's name, running from warrants in Montana and the state of Washington. One was for escape. The other was for kidnapping his ex-wife. So Scott formed a new identity, was on an Alaska fishing boat, hooked himself on purpose with a treble fishing hook that caused severe spreading of disease into his knee. And he was having Fisherman's Finest pay for his medical bills. And while he was doing that, he had forged checks from them made payable to himself. He was not only milking them for money to fix the knee thing that he created himself, but then he was forging checks to himself under his brother's name. He finally got arrested for this check fraud, and when he's up there in Alaska is when he starts these murder-for-hire scams he performs on the FBI. So it started up there in Alaska in late 2001. He goes down to Seattle to get away from his supposedly life was in danger because he's a valuable FBI informant. He spends another murder-for-hire there says his life's in danger, and then comes all the way down to Denver, where his ex-wife and his kids were. So that's what attracted him to manipulate the Bureau of Prisons and the FBI to get him all the way down here to Denver. So he had three murder for hires going within a six-month period. That then is what brought him down, and he's released from the check fraud from Alaska in December 2002, by then, though, this scam with Jennifer Markham going to kill people, it had been in the works with Scott and FBI Denver for about four months. A real interesting trail of court documents that some of the local newspapers had got a hold of, of how Scott was an FBI informant, yet he was being released in society under what should be federal probation. And you can't be both. You can't be an FBI informant and on probation. So probation then recused themselves from overseeing Scott because you can't be both. When Scott is actually released in December of 2002, in this murder for hire, the FBI Denver case agent is the only one watching over him, and he doesn't have the capabilities of a probation department. And he has no idea that Scott is a serial killer. All he thinks that Scott is is a check fraud forgery guy, which he was, and a very good one, but he's also a serial killer. So for one year, from December 2002 to December 2003, Scott really has no supervision. Not only do Jennifer and Casey go missing, but multiple other people go missing as well, while he is an FBI informant and unsupervised at the time, because he's supposedly saving lives in Denver. I want to be real careful because we are going to talk about an FBI agent who didn't see things at the time, Carl. We'll also talk about Kimball's two wives, two women that he was married to. And the public, when you see that, you're going to say, that agent's stupid. Those wives are foolish. But when you're in the middle with someone like Scott Kimball, when his manipulation skills are, I would say, a 10 out of 10, you need a spotter. And that's what I had. When I saw what Scott did to the FBI agent Carl and to both of his wives and either to other law enforcement, my boss and I agreed I would never be with this man alone because who knows what he would do to me. From 2006 till I retired in 2021, I spent 15 years with this man. And yet not once did I meet with him alone. And I knew him as well, unfortunately, as I knew my family, everything about him. But because how manipulative Scott is and how well he can see into your life, know what strings to pull and know how to turn you around to where you don't know which way is north, I never spent time alone with him. We'll go through of how he, he tricked the FBI, how he deceived his wives and how he tried to kill his own children for money. But uh, it's so easy for the public when you, if you've never been around someone like Scott, I've applied the Scott manipulation matrix to other serial killers, but normally it's a one-time homicide when your wife goes missing or a child goes missing and a suspect would try to manipulate himself out of trouble, manipulate me. And after working with Scott, it's not even close. I would actually rate them from like, oh, that's an eight on the Kimball scale or maybe a six. Scott's manipulation skills is what really stands out to me after 15 years of working him and a lot of other cases like him in between. He's at the top of the scale. Yeah, and you'll see why. 
After I start looking into the file and see Jennifer references to Casey, I also see a reference to his uncle, Terry, coming to town after Scott's son, Justin, is gravely injured. Scott's son was 10 years old, Justin, at the time. A cattle grate fell on his head, and within minutes, he falls out of Scott's Jeep as it's going 50 miles an hour to the hospital, suffers another grave injury to his head, and almost dies on the operating table. It was a very strange situation. Both were ruled accidents, but I was teamed up with this Detective Thatcher, who's referenced in our file, who's looking at check fraud for Scott, and he's the one Detective Thatcher had referenced that Casey went missing. And he also had heard tales about his uncle Terry going missing right after Scott's son, Justin, suffered two almost fatal injuries while he was alone with Scott. I had three people, really four when you consider Justin's two almost fatal injuries in one day. And then his uncle Terry comes to town and Terry disappears and Casey disappears and Jennifer disappears. So I had four very odd occurrences with him. Yeah, really violent occurrences. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we had missing people. So I reached out to the profiling unit. It's the first time I had. I was, you know, agent of eight years at the time, worked a lot of violent crime. But when people go missing, I had no clue how to work that. And I teamed up with one of the profilers. His name's Armin. And Armin shepherded me through this case. Armin since retired, but he was fantastic. He was just a voice in my ear about how to slowly and methodically work a case like this and how to ask more questions of why instead of what happened, where did it happen, when did it happen. I got as much profiling training as I could, thanks to Armin, became the coordinator for Denver and was able to work in that role for 15 years as well. But Armin brought a new layer of how to assess someone like Scott, and it is to really dig deeply into him. So when I first got this case, I see these people go missing around him. Armin's telling me, let's try to turn this into some type of homicide case, because we're pretty sure these people are dead, but we can't prove it yet. Scott was up in jail in Montana. And I called the warden up there because Scott was making a lot of calls to his current wife, a girlfriend, and other people to just manipulate people to do things for him while he was in jail. The warden had actually told me, he's like, well, it's funny you called. We were just about to release him, even though he's on holds from multiple states, because he says he can get us this drug dealer from the outside that's introducing contraband into our prison. And we're going to do a deal with him on the outside. I said, please don't, (laughs) because this guy has been released from Alaska, Seattle, Denver. He was arrested in California. And I said, I think if you let him out, we might not ever see him again. The warden agreed not to let him out of prison. And I got to start listening to Scott's phone calls, and they were fascinating. Explain to everyone how you're able to listen to Scott's conversations while he is incarcerated, because I think it's important for them to have that distinction of why we can do that. Very good. Well, I speak about Scott Kimball to a lot of our high schools here in Colorado and some to our universities because there's so much to learn from him. And I, I use this as a teaching point to say, don't go to prison or jail because you lose your right to privacy. And when you're in jail, you can have your letters opened and read that are to and from you. And you can also have your phone calls listened to. There's an admonishment that anytime you call someone from the outside, and the the admonishments vary, but it's basically telling the person on the outside, talking to the inmate, that this call is from a federal prison. This call may be monitored. That actually warning comes on like every five to 10 minutes. So everybody knows those calls are recorded. So if there's not enough reason to stay out of jail, at least just maybe one is your phone calls are always recorded. Great question. So then to continue, he's manipulating. He had two girlfriends at the time, his wife, Lori. Lori is Casey's mom. Casey was a 19-year-old who disappeared around the same time as Jennifer. And Lori's trying to figure out if Scott was responsible for Casey's disappearance. At the same time, she's trying to love her husband, who's supposedly wrongfully incarcerated. So those were very complex conversations. The other is him having his girlfriend in California do things for him, and he was just a web. And then finally, his mom, whose name is Barb, Barb passed away about four years ago. Barb and I became close friends after our first few interviews. Barb had more insight into her son, Scott, than anybody in this case. But Barb still treated him like a son, even though he had stolen from the family. 
She knew that Uncle Terry disappeared at Scott's hands. She knew that Scott probably tried to kill her grandson, Justin, twice. And all these awful things had happened around Scott, but she was still his mom. And she was walking that line of being the mom of someone who most likely has done awful things, but nothing had been proven. What's he in jail in Montana for? Was it just another con fraud scam? After Scott was our, the FBI's informant for a year, and he didn't produce this murder for hire case, U.S. probation in Denver got permission from the courts to take him over, and he was no longer an informant. So now we're into 2004. Scott manipulated the probation officer for a year. He was actually going to and from California without permission all the time. He was writing a bunch of bad checks. He was stealing from any and everybody and killing people, but we as the uh, Justice Department didn't know. But he violated probation like 100 times in 2004, 2005, and they finally filed a warrant on him. So that was one. The other is Montana. If you remember when Scott was on that fishing boat under his brother Brett's name in Alaska, Montana had filed an accumulation of warrants. Scott had grown up in Montana from age 10, back and forth from Montana to Colorado, and just accumulated deferred sentence after deferred sentence to where they all came to a head. The lead prosecutor in Montana filed what's called a governor's warrant for Scott, and he was running from that as well. So that governor's warrant was not dismissed, even while Scott was an informant in Colorado. So he goes on the run for not only the governor's warrant, but for check fraud in Denver and finally probation violations. So he was in trouble for three different ways. He goes and lives a new life in California, gets a new girlfriend. And then finally, the U.S. Marshals find him out there, get into a high speed chase through cornfields. And it was on the news, helicopters involved and all that sort of thing. So he's arrested out in California on multiple violations from all over the country, but nothing having to do with homicides. And since Montana had had this governor's warrant forever, he goes there first. So that's why he's up there in Montana. So then I've hooked up with Armin. I'm listening to all these phone calls. I'm learning a lot about Scott. And I start doing interviews. Once I figure out that Scott has stolen from someone, whether it's his brother or his mom, I don't talk to them yet because I don't want to get him back to Scott. But most often he steals from other inmates. And he had a couple that would lose their girlfriends. And I didn't know that until later, but I start getting permission from FBI Denver to travel. And I go around the country and start talking with these guys. One that I speak with, his name is Brett Gamblin. He's up there in Montana at a different facility than Scott. But I go up and speak with Brett and I bring Gary, the, the Lafayette detective, who's started me on this trail with the check fraud forgery. And Brett tells us that he worked with Scott for about a year when Scott was uh, our informant down here in Denver. Brett was on probation. He actually thought Scott was his probation officer because Scott had drawn up paperwork that he was supervising Brett and that he was speaking with Montana. Are you he serious? Wow. Oh, yeah. We, we actually found that in a search of Kimball's trailer later of him practicing the seal of Adams County Probation Department. It looked pretty good. The gold seal and the letterhead and all that sort of stuff. But he had Brett helping him as a cattle hand when he was running a scam on a cattle business of pretending that it's Rocky Mountain all natural beef when he's actually buying sick cows that are headed for the glue factory and selling them at meat markets. But Brett is helping him and thinking that he's serving out his probation and parole down here in Colorado. The reason that I knew to talk to Brett was Brett had had some stories about Scott, about killing people. And when we speak with Brett up there in Montana, he's like, I don't know what's true, what's not. There was this one time when we were at a Sonic before work, we're having breakfast. And Kimball tells Brett, he goes, I know a guy that'll pay you $10,000 to go cut out the breast implants and an IUD of a drug dealing girl who's in the mountains. Brett's like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, she was basically a prostitute. She was working for this drug dealer. She's worth nothing, but she'll be identified by these breast implants and IUD unless we get it cut out. And this guy will pay me to pay you 10,000 bucks to go cut them out. <laughs> OK, so right. this is somebody he thinks is his probation officer giving him this proposal. Correct. OK. Yeah. So then Brett's like, 
No, I don't think so, he says, uh, because we all know that if someone's in the mountains, they're not going to be there anymore. And I asked Brett what he meant, and he goes, well, me and Scott are both hunters, and if you leave someone up in the mountains, they're going to be scavenged and torn to pieces. And he tells Scott that. He goes, that's ridiculous. No, you don't have to worry about her because she'll be torn apart by scavengers. Scott said, no, this girl's been downsized. Her head was cut off, her arms, her legs, and all that put under a large rock. So he goes, all that's going to be in one place. And Brett's like, no, not doing it. So then Brett told me other stories about their travels to and from California when Scott was going there, about him talking about killing hitchhikers and how he would see some a girl on the side of the road and talk about maybe I could put her in a hole, torture her for a couple days, and then kill her. And he just felt comfortable talking with Brett in a way he didn't feel with other people. And I think it's because he had that parole, probation sort of control over him. Brett put me on to some other people. I would interview inmates, and these stories from Scott would leak out about killing people. Besides that, I dug a little bit more deeply into what happened with Jennifer Markham. Jennifer was the girlfriend of his Denver cellmate that disappeared. The Denver cellmate's name was Steve Ennis, or still is Steve Ennis. Steve was just a high school kid here in Denver, went to an affluent high school, not really a hardened criminal, but Scott made him appear like one to the Denver FBI to where we think he's this big kingpin drug dealer and he had never been interviewed before. But Steve had told Scott that supposedly Jennifer was going to go kill people on the outside and that's what started the murder for hire thing here. And that's what Scott reported on for months to Carl, the FBI agent. Eventually, when Scott got jammed up for check fraud and forgery here, he was only out for about four months when all this check fraud forgery kept coming up because he was stealing from any and everybody. He gets arrested, gets sent to Denver Police Department on all these warrants, and he goes, hey, hey, I can help you guys with something much more important than check fraud forgery. This girl named Jennifer that was supposed to go kill people, she's dead, and I know who killed her. And you give me a polygraph right now, and I can help you find out what happened to her. Carl goes down there. DEA actually comes because Steve Ennis, his cellmate, was in there on a DEA case. He had been selling drugs. Foolish. This was his first arrest. But anyway, it was a DEA case. And so DEA, FBI, and Denver Police Department all there, and they give Scott a polygraph. Do you know for sure who killed Jennifer Markham? And Scott said, yes, it's a guy named Jason Price. And he passes the polygraph. So FBI Denver then and, and these other agencies are weighing, okay, you have a couple of check frauds. Yes, he's stealing from people, but now he's going to help us solve this murder. And he says Jennifer Markham is buried in a creek bed near Rifle, passes that part of the polygraph as well. And so because of that, some calls were made. These local warrants dropped, and Scott's back out of jail, now trying to help the FBI target this Jason Price. And he came up. He was a friend of Steve Ennis's, but, and I talked to Steve some while Steve's in jail, but we had never heard his name before he passes this polygraph. So then for about six months, Carl and the FBI and even some DEA are really looking hard at this Jason Price, trying to find Jennifer in this creek bed and rifle. That all started with him passing the polygraph test. Scott then, once he's out of prison, he has nowhere to go because he's swindled everybody. He has no friends because a friend to Scott just means that's someone who I take money from. So he goes and lives with his mom, Barb, up in Arvada, which is a suburb northwest of Denver. He's telling mom that he is working for the FBI, but his job for the FBI is to rescue prostitutes who are being ushered down to a trailer in Colorado Springs and being killed in snuff films to where a person actually dies on film, is murdered, and the people who do the film are profiting from that murder. And what? It, yeah. So it's really ingenious, though. If you look at what's happening, the storyline to the FBI is that Jennifer was involved in a murder plot and she was killed by Jason Price and we're going to go find her near Rifle. But the FBI had nothing to do with that. But what Scott was doing, and I know this going back to when he lived in Spokane, is soliciting prostitutes all the time. So what he's basically telling mom is, if I get caught with a prostitute, it's because I'm working for the FBI. He also knows that the FBI will never tell mom what he actually does for them, because we can't. He's an informant. He's covering that line. With Steve Ennis, 
Steve thinks that Scott got out because he's going to get Jennifer out of stripping. Jennifer was a stripper, very beautiful girl. And the reason I believe Scott was attracted to Jennifer was because she's a bodybuilder, a stripper, blonde hair, blue eyed. And Steve had pictures of her in his cell and she's a knockout. So I think when Scott saw a trophy like Jennifer, he's like, yeah, she's going to be the part of my next murder for hire case. Steve was under the impression that Scott was going to rescue Jennifer out of stripping and get her into a coffee shop that he owned way up in Washington, which she, of course, he didn't even own. And then finally, when Scott gets out within two months, he meets Casey's mom. Her name is Lori. And he tells Lori that he's working for the FBI, but he's working on a case involving three Jennifers. And one of the Jennifers is really bad. So it's the drug dealer, Jennifer. And what's amazing to me, Jerry, and I know you worked cases like this, it's really hard to keep one lie versus reality correct because you have to jump back and forth between the lie and the truth. Scott had four stories going at once, one to the FBI, one to Barb, his mom, one to Steve, the cellmate, and Jennifer. She thought she was going to a coffee shop. The fourth one to Lori McLeod, who's Casey's mom. And he's able to keep all of them straight, all four of those. Of course, I was seeing the FBI narrative, but when I interviewed the other three, he wasn't jumping back and forth. He was able to keep them straight. Yeah, and it's really amazing because when you hear all of them together, I'm thinking, oh, you know, who would believe that? But each person is only hearing their part of the lie, of the con, which is easier to believe. But I guess that's why when you were going through his stuff and learning about all these different things, that's when you were able, as opposed to Carl, to say, wait a minute, what's really going on here? You're right. And that would even happen, Jerry, with me, because I would be in front of Scott probably a hundred times. And I would have to come back, listen to the recording and even type it up to say, oh, that's what's happening. But when you're in the middle of him, he's got so many. And I, I would picture it as like in the circus where a guy can spin plates on the sticks one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, four at a time. And Scott could keep those plates spinning. Until you get away from it and you the plates fall and you're able to look at the plate in detail, you can't assess that while you're in front of him. You just have to get away from him. So what I'm able to see going back is that it's right around the time that Scott meets Casey's mom, Lori, is when Jennifer disappears. I'm friends with Lori now. And as she looks back at this, she meets him on Valentine's Day, 2003. That's when he's saying the three Jennifer story. Jennifer disappears three days later. He's going back and forth and dating Lori while he's keeping Jennifer. Jennifer disappears for a three-day period, February 17th to February 20th. Her car is parked at Denver International Airport on the 17th, and then her cell phone hits off a tower in Utah on the 20th, but she's not making any calls during that period. What I believe, and multiple talks with Kimball later, he never admits to sexually assaulting her, but he says they were having sex all the time. I believe that she was drugged, and I believe that Kimball was doing awful things to her for those three days. And then I believe that he took her across the state line to make law enforcement, if she was discovered, look somewhere else, dump her in Utah, and then come back. Lori almost sees it as a continuous timeline because Scott would travel at night As Lori would tell me, Lori eventually marries Scott, and she says he needed maybe four hours of sleep a night. And when he is on, it's like when you turn on a light switch. It's not like it takes him time to wake up. He's on, and he is going. Lori didn't even know he disappeared to Utah and disposed of Jennifer's body. That's what I'm able to see again while the dust has settled, is that February the 17th, February 20th time frame, same time he's dating Casey's mom is when Jennifer disappeared. I keep doing interviews. I eventually interview Lori. I interview a lot of the other people that Scott had deceived. And I interviewed Jennifer's parents. And that was the most heartbreaking interview because Jennifer's dad, Bob Markham, had become a detective over these now three years that his daughter had been missing. And I gave all sorts of apologies on behalf of the FBI. And we did not know who Scott was and trying to figure out who he is, working with the profiling, et cetera. And Bob is just vomiting information my way, which is super helpful because he's interacted with Scott multiple times. So has Jennifer's mom, Mary Willis. They're divorced, but Scott's trying to manipulate both of them separately, and they have just been doing their own sorts of investigation. 
Scott actually tried to meet with Jennifer's mom, Mary, separately in a Broomfield hotel and told her that if she told anyone about it, that he wouldn't tell her what happened to her daughter. But she didn't go. He had told her stuff about Jennifer that only Jennifer would know. And again, it's detailed stuff about what happened to her and as a child. I mean, it's it's more detailed than I can even substantiate at this point. But Mary knew that Scott knew her well. He said, if you tell anybody about our secret meeting, it's off and you'll never know what happened to your daughter because Mary and Bob were trying to separately question Scott at the time. So Mary did not tell Scott. She goes, fine, I'll meet you at my motel room at midnight. Scott draws up an agreement between him and Mary, which I I don't find for another six months, but I find it out in California with these guns he stashed away. And in the agreement, it says, it looks like an FBI form, Jerry. You, if I could show it to you, you would crack up at it. It looks like one of our FD whatevers. It's a consent form that says, I, fill in the blank, do give, and he went under the alias of Joe Scott, do give Joe Scott permission to enter my hotel room. I am a willing participant. I expect to engage in bondage and sexual activity. Joe Scott has my permission to bind, gag, and engage with me sexually, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on for a paragraph. It is basically saying we're going to do all this weird sex stuff. He shows up at her door with that. He's banging on the door. Mary is finally on the phone with Bob, Jennifer's dad, saying, I don't feel comfortable last minute meeting with him. And Bob says, I've been looking at this guy for two years, Mary. He killed our daughter. If you open that door, you're going to die tonight. So Mary did not open the door. After that, she recorded a couple of conversations with Scott, which were spectacular for our case. I've got to ask you a question here. Did Mary ever find out about that agreement? Obviously, she didn't see it that night and she didn't sign it. But did she ever find out that he was going to ask her to sign this contract that allowed him to do these things to her? And what did she say when she if she did find out about it? She knew that Scott wanted to have sex with her based upon him wanting to meet her in the park. He never said that, but in her voice recording, she goes, I know you're wanting to get into my pants. And this seems just so awkward with, I'm trying to find out what happened to my daughter and you're doing this. And Scott would flip it around like he did with any investigator or whatever, said, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you wanting to find out what happens to your daughter. Almost like bribing her. Wow. uh Yeah, wow. blackmailing her with <laughs> mm-hmm. how badly do you want this? Let's not even talk about what you think is uncomfortable. Let's talk about how much do you want to find out what happened to your daughter? Those type of conversations that Mary turned over to me that we eventually put into a search warrant. Did she get to read the statement? Because yeah, I, having I sex with someone it. is yeah. different than them wanting to bind and uh, torture her. Yeah, I don't know that I have. I've had a lot of conversations with Mary over the years, especially when we're trying to find Jennifer and what sentence Scott should get and all this. I don't know that I ever read her word for word what this was, but it wouldn't have surprised her if Scott had presented this to her. It wouldn't have caught her off guard because of the intent that she could sense from him and how he, like I, you had assessed and I had, that he's basically blackmailing her to find out how far are you willing to go to, to know what happened to your girl. That's evil. It is. It's very much like Scott, though. And you used the word evil, and I I was violent crime for 23 of my 25 years. I investigated a lot of horrible things people did. But Scott, and I'm sure you found this in your career as well, Scott is one of the very few evil people I ran across. A lot of people, even though they would let themselves go down the pathway of violent behavior, they don't become evil. They hate what they've become. And Scott enjoyed it. I was able to use between the Markhams and Brett Gamblin and these other inmates that I spoke with. When Scott was arrested, he had a laptop and they found a lot of this fraud on it, like him pretending to be a probation officer and whatever else. But they also saw violent sexual pictures on there. But you can't look at that because of the fraud charges. So I wrote a federal search warrant under the kidnapping statute that Casey had disappeared under him and Jennifer had and that there are signs on there of sexual torture. And I use stuff like, you know, the Brett Gamblin, he cuts up, possibly he talks in third person about women being cut up, etc. But that stuff will likely be on his computer. And I, I took it to a federal judge and he's like, this is crazy stuff. Never read anything like this. I need a couple more paragraphs. 
So by now I'm talking with Casey's mom, Lori, and she's trusting me enough to give me some of the weird stuff Scott talked to her about and about Casey being missing and her thinking that that's a problem as well. Lori gives me a couple more paragraphs, and so I get the warrant signed. And when I look in Scott's computer, we have our lab do a search. It is a lot of rape videos, torture uh, females. I don't see any male torture. It's all females. And it's knives to their throat. It's them being cut. It's them being hung from trees. It is very disturbing. It's mostly that 2004, 2005 time frame. And again, this is not acting. This appears to be real, live abduction and binding and torture going on. Yeah, and it's not him. Eventually, I don't know this, but I do see some of his victims on here, but they're not being raped and tortured. It's just some pictures that he's taking of them. But most of them is him looking at other things. The other thing that you'd find interesting is he's following the case of BTK, Dennis Rader. Rader was a study for BAU, Behavior Analysis Unit, a high-functioning serial killer who was out of Kansas who taunted law enforcement for years. I would see some news articles about Rader as a serial killer and then some of his pictures in court, et cetera, on Scott's computer. And after studying Dennis Rader and studying Scott, they appear to be very similar, but Rader killed much less frequently than Kimball did. Rader would go for years at a time without killing. Again, like Scott, a family man, you would never suspect. He might have some things going on, but he was able to be a serial killer for a long time. With all this then, and with working with Behavior Analysis Unit, I decided to take a run at Scott up there in the Montana prison about Casey. Jennifer disappeared in February 2003. He's Scott starts dating mom right around that same time, Lori. Casey is 18 at the time, turns 19, and is living with Scott and Lori as Scott's doing his fake cattle business. This is up in a Broomfield, Colorado area. Casey has a boyfriend. His name is CB. They work at a local subway. Six months after Jennifer disappeared, Scott set the table to have Casey disappear. So what Scott does is CB, Casey's boyfriend, thinks that Scott is an FBI agent. Scott was able to do this. He would target people that he knew would not talk like he did Brett Gamblin. CB was 20 or 21 at the time. He didn't say, I'm an FBI informant. He said, I'm an FBI agent. I'm undercover. I also work with the NSA. He showed CB his laptop, which had the FBI seal on it. Scott carried around a handgun holstered. And then when Carl would show up, Carl's his informant handler from the FBI. He would say, this is my supervisor. He's about to show up. You know, he's from FBI and we're, we got to talk case stuff. So he would do that in front of CB to where CB's thinking that's just his boss showing up. But Carl doesn't has no idea he's authenticating this to CB. So to set the table for Casey's disappearance, Scott had represented himself as FBI to CB. And not only that, he found out that CB had an outstanding ticket from Denver police. He told CB that he could not be an FBI agent and be around somebody with warrants. He takes CB down to Denver Police Department and turns him in. Now to CB, CB is seeing Scott as an FBI agent when he walks him up to the front desk and says, this kid has a warrant. He needs to turn himself in. The Denver Police Department officer on duty only sees this as a concerned adult who's trying to teach a kid a lesson. Scott, though, authenticates more firmly to CB, if you mess with me, you're messing with the FBI. CB spends a day in jail. Scott's there to bond him back out, and he brings him home to Lori's house. Within a couple of days, and Scott also gets a, an elk hunting ticket, so he'll have an alibi to be out of town around the same day that he books CB in jail and gets him back out. So he tells Lori, I'm about to go elk hunting, and it's up in northwestern Colorado is where he pulled the tag. CB and Casey living at the house, they're 18, 19, and 20 years old. They had been recreationally using drugs, and Lori had threatened him, if, if I catch drugs in my house one more time, you guys are both gone and I'm calling the cops. Well, Lori and I, at this point, both believe that Scott's the one that planted the drugs. So when Lori comes home and Scott says, look in the couch, what I found, it's a vial, what looks to be like drugs. And Lori says, I am kicking them out. I'm calling the cops right now. They are done. Scott says, wait, 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 hold on. Let me fix this. I've got connections. Maybe we shouldn't throw them in prison or jail, that sort of thing. And he goes, just let me handle it. Scott goes and finds Casey and CB and says, you can't come home or you'll go to jail. 
I will put you up in a hotel while Lori figures this out. He makes Lori the bad guy. So he puts them up in a Motel 6, about five miles from their house, and says, don't try to get in touch with her or she'll turn you into the cops. Why is that important, Jerry? What's Scott doing at this point to Casey? Oh, he's making her trust him, and he's also setting up his own alibi. Absolutely. What I've seen that Scott also does so well, and I I see this with especially domestic incidents when a, a husband's about to kill a wife, is they will isolate them. They'll take them away from their family, their friends, even their co-workers, they they start, it's like uh, you're thinning the herd to where that person is the only one left. And Scott has the foresight to know that he has to get her not only away from mom, if she's going to disappear, he's also got to get her away from CB. They're inseparable. They're actually engaged informally at the time. So he has the drugs for mom, Lori, and he cuts communication line. And communication is so critical. If someone's going to go missing, you don't want them talking to each other. He says, you guys can't call each other because if Lori calls Casey, she's going to throw her in jail. If Casey calls Lori, she thinks she's going to jail. Fast forward one day, Scott shows up and tells Casey she's got to go to work. And this is in front of CB. They both work at a subway that's about seven miles away. Scott pulls up in his pickup with his camper attached and CB says, okay, well, I love you. And he puts the engagement necklace that they have on her. They kiss each other goodbye. And CB sees Scott take off with Lori in his F-250 with the camper attached. And that's the last anybody sees Casey. Within hours, Subway calls both CB and Lori to say Casey didn't show up for work. They end up calling each other. And CB says, Scott took Casey in the trailer. I don't know why I didn't turn her into work. And Lori's saying, no, he's hunting. So they're all confused. They're both trying to call, and neither Scott nor Casey's phone are working, because why? They're in the mountains. Scott's already set that on the table. Scott's phone comes back on in a little over a day. He calls Lori and says, I'm heading back. And Lori's frantic, like, where's Casey? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, we'll need to talk. And Scott's like, look, I can't, I don't have cell coverage. So he comes back around into Denver. It's about a two, almost three hour drive from where he was up in Northwest Colorado. And when he gets back, he pulls in with his truck and trailer. CB and Lori are both anxiously awaiting. CB's running through the trailer, calling for Casey. And Lori's going, what happened? He's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been elk hunting this whole time. And CB just comes right up to him, accuses him, says, I saw you. I saw Casey get into your truck. I put my necklace on her, told her I loved her, and you took off with her to Subway. Scott's like, CB, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been elk hunting this whole time. And then there's kind of a pause. CB has to decide if he's going to call this FBI agent a liar, or he does have a drug habit. He has got thrown in jail. He doesn't know what to do. I talked with Lori and CB multiple times about this interaction, but uh, CB's like, I'm going to lose. So he turns around, gets out of there. Scott turns to Lori and says, I think CB did something with your daughter. He says, maybe she's in one of these drug houses that they've been using. So that evening, Scott drives her around to what he says are known drug houses from working with the FBI in Denver, trying to find Casey. He files missing person reports for Casey with Thornton Police, which is where the hotel was, with some other jurisdictions. They're saying she's an adult. She's disappeared once before for a month or two from Lori when they were in Arizona. So police aren't taking it real seriously at this point. But within a week, he tells Casey's mom, Lori, look, I will spend the rest of my life and all my FBI connections looking for your daughter. Let's do this as a team. Let's get married. So he brings Lori, drives her out to Vegas from Denver. As they're driving past Rifle, which Rifle is three hours west of Denver, he looks at the Rifle sign with Lori in the car. They're on their way to get married in Vegas. And he goes, that's where Jennifer's buried. Remember the three Jennifers? That's where one of them is buried. As they're driving past Rifle, off they go. They get married in Vegas. They come back for their honeymoon. They go where? To Northwest Colorado, near a town called Walden. And Scott says, Laura, you have earned this break, this rest. I'm going to go out on this four-wheeler for the day. You just sit here and relax and enjoy yourself. And it's the birds chirping. It's beautiful. It's mountain air. Jerry, this is within probably five miles of where Casey was strewn out across the mountainside. And we believe Scott was going back to police up the crime scene during their honeymoon. Unbelievable. The mother of the girl he has murdered. He's now married. And while they're on their honeymoon, is going to go clean up 
the evidence that he murdered her. Unbelievable. Yeah, but nobody knows that until much, much later. Scott knows. Scott knows, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, and I don't even know this Casey story. I interview him first with Gary, and we spend six hours with him in a, a small interview room in Montana. This was an eye-opener for me because I'm used to the FBI walking into a, a jail and someone like Scott, and I knew Scott was egotistical, confident, whatever else. Even then, when the FBI comes into something, people are like, uh-oh, this is a big deal now. Scott had me sized up in like two seconds. I introduced myself, say I'm from Denver. We need to talk about what happened with you and Carl, with these missing people, et cetera. He's like, okay. We go in and sit down, and we're in a small white room. It's me, Gary, from Lafayette, and Scott, and I have my boss watching me. Like I said, I'm never alone with this guy. Within the first five minutes, Jerry, he goes, you know what, Agent Grusing? I think I'll have a pizza. And I'm like, mm. I don't say this out loud, but inmates aren't in control. FBI is in control. I said, well, we'll get you something to eat. We have a lot to talk about here. He goes, no, I have a pizza now. And so I'm like, what the heck? People don't do this to me. He's almost blackmailing you. No, mm -hmm. if you want to talk to me, you get me my damn pizza. Exactly. What he taught me there is me flying from Denver to Montana, me renting a car, spending the night, all these federal dollars that I spent to get to him doesn't make me important. It makes him ultimately important. It's like, we don't spend that type of money unless we know he's very valuable. So he just like slaps that card on the table basically and says, you're mine. <laughs> and I kind of look in the, I can't see through the one-way glass. I went in and talked to my boss, Phil, and he's like, yep, order the pizza. So that's how my relationship with Scott started, is within five minutes ordering this guy a pizza. He's like a boxer, like dodging and weaving, and he's pulling out more from me than I ever hoped to give him. We had already made a decision that we weren't going to let him totally manipulate us the whole time. And, you know, he's toying around with us about Uncle Terry disappearing. Yeah, CB's a criminal. Casey, yeah, she always disappeared. Jennifer, oh yeah, that's Jason Price. Already passed the polygraph. And no, I'd love to help you guys, but mainly he's seeing what we will do for him. I'm jammed up here on this check fraud BS. What are you guys going to do for me? I'd, be, I'd love to talk. Yeah, let's, let's find these people together. He still wants to be in the informant role instead of the suspect role. After about six hours, I'm like, all right, Scott, we're done. He's like, well, it's funny, Agent Grusin. You said you wanted to find out what happened to these girls. Doesn't look like you're really interested. I know I'm difficult to deal with, but, you know, if you want to quit, go home, Denver. That's your deal. Does that sound like kind of what he did to Mary Willis? Saying, how badly do you want this? And if you're not willing to just put up with me manipulating you all day, then I guess you don't want to solve the case. But we went ahead and went back. And I did a lot more aggressive interviews at that point. We spoke with Casey's parents, uh, Rob as well. We spoke a lot more with Barb, the mom. I finally approached Steve Ennis, Jennifer's boyfriend, and Jennifer was the one who was supposed to be in a coffee shop per his mind. But I'm like, the FBI at that point, they, they were so focused on, because Scott had made it the focus, this drug deal, Steve Ennis involved, wanting Jennifer to kill people. And Jason Price, he's the main suspect. Scott had passed the polygraph. I still had to blow that up and have Scott be the only suspect. So I went down to Houston with Gary and we talked to Steve Ennis. By now, it's four years since Jennifer's disappeared. Steve is still in love with her, but he hasn't heard from her in four years. He starts crying when we start talking about Jennifer. And he said, yeah, I just, I thought she left me. I thought she went back to someone in New York, maybe with Kimball. I have no idea. You know, I trusted Scott, but now I'm hearing all these other people like Jason Price saying they think he's a killer. He goes, I don't know what to think. We didn't get really anything out of Steve except a waste of taxpayers' money for us to fly down to Houston and find this heartbroken guy that has no idea what happened to his girlfriend. And we're waiting for a guard to come. And at the end, I did what I should have done before we asked for the guard to come and say, so what else is going on, Steve? Anything else besides Jennifer? What's prison life like? What else is happening? He's like, oh, now that you mention it, once he got outside of Jennifer, he goes, there's another Steve that lost his girlfriend to Scott. He goes, his name is Steve Holly. He was trying to escape from prison. And his girlfriend, Leanne, I think she disappeared even before Jennifer did. But it's very sane. You should go talk to him. Scary mm -hmm. thing, Jerry. That mm -hmm. If we didn't have that extra time for the guard to come, I would have never had this new timeline for Leanne Emery. Steve Holly was a guy we arrested for bank robbery years ago. I go talk to him. 
interesting character, but he said that, yeah, same time that Scott is manipulating Steve Ennis to get rid of Jennifer, he's also manipulating Steve Hawley to hook Kimball up with Leanne. Leanne's on the outside, and Leanne is his girlfriend, to engineer an escape. Leanne is not a criminal, but Scott helps her become one. What would happen is Steve Hawley and Kimball would walk the yard. You know what walking the yard is, don't you? Yes. For those that aren't familiar, if you're in prison, you have a little track around. It's, you're not outside the gate, but you're just inside the gate, and you're walking the yard talking. And as Steve Hawley and Kimball are doing this, they're figuring out ways to escape from the prison. And one is to throw a rope ladder over there, have a white truck drive up. The guard's response time they're measuring, and they're just thinking, this isn't going to be that hard. Scott has brokered a deal with Steve Hawley in that if Hawley will kill his ex-wife, so this isn't Lori. He hasn't even met Lori yet. This is the mom. Her name's Larissa of Scott's two boys. Larissa lives in Denver. Larissa and Scott are divorced. It was a very contentious divorce. Scott lost to Larissa, and Scott is a narcissist. I don't normally label people, but there's no better way to describe Scott than a manipulator and a narcissist, because you cannot embarrass a narcissist. I couldn't be sarcastic with Scott. I'm a very sarcastic person. But if my sarcasm would make Scott think that he's less smart than me or I'm trying to one-up him, I'd had to cut it out or else I was done. The reason I bring that up with Larissa is that when Larissa found out Scott was having sex with prostitutes, doing all this weird stuff up in Spokane, Washington, she divorced him. So she won. And Scott was hell-bent on getting revenge, but he couldn't do it. He knew that if he killed his wife, he'd be number one suspect. So as they're walking the yard, him and Steve Hawley, the bank robber, He's like, look, if you will torture and kill my wife, ex-wife Larissa, I will hook you up with Leanne and get you out of prison. And so they broker this deal. And Scott's like, but look, I'm, I'm an FBI informant working with them. She can't know my true name. So why don't you call her my prison name? And Holly's like, oh, you're a sick mf -er. Because Scott's prison name was Hannibal from Hannibal Lecter. Uh, that's okay. what we call a clue. Yeah, because Scott would ask... There was a doctor in prison. His name's Dr. Alderman. He would ask him about how to keep people alive if you're torturing them. And he would do this in front of Steve Hawley and others. They're like, you're sick. You know, and he's like, eh, it's just my research project. So they, he had a nickname of Hannibal. Hawley says, deal. She can't know your true name. I'll tell her I'm going to hook you up with Hannibal and that you are going to engineer an escape for me and that you'll get me and Leanne down to Mexico. He says, cool. So, Jerry, now that I've found out about Leanne, I get search warrants, you know, to look for email accounts and whatever else. You can see her sending these secret emails. She's with Scott for that one month, same time that he's doing the Jennifer scam. He's meeting with Jennifer. He's got the FBI on the hook. He's talking about Jennifer wanting to go kill people. This is in January 2003. He's meeting with Leanne every single day under our notes. We don't know it. But he's telling her that his name is Hannibal and that he's going to break her boyfriend, Steve, out of prison. She's sending secret emails to her cousin saying, this Hannibal guy is kind of weird. My boyfriend slash husband says I should trust him, but wants to have sex with me and all this weird stuff. So I have emails confirming this Hannibal thing, but not until four years after she disappeared. What I found out, though, I called the aunt's dad. His name is Howard. And I don't know right at this point if she's dead, missing, whatever. But I say, hey, can I speak with Leanne? And he said, well, I haven't spoken with Leanne in four years. I hope you know something I don't. I'm like, oh, crap. And he points me to police reports. And she disappeared January 29th of 2003. That's three weeks before Jennifer disappeared. Her car was basically staged near Moab, Utah, right across the state line, which is very close to where Jennifer's cell phone last hit off of, right across the state line in Utah. Now we have four missing people. We have Uncle Terry, we have Casey, we have Jennifer, and we have Leanne. And I almost have a better trail on Leanne than anybody because I've got this secret relationship he was hiding from the FBI while he's trying to get Leanne's boyfriend to escape, but we have confirmation of her emails with him. Could you tell us just a little bit about Uncle Terry? Because we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah, Uncle Terry. So when you have three girls that are missing from ages 19 to 25, their parents, once they find out that we're involved, they put tremendous pressure back on the FBI to basically fix our mistake. And not only that, you have sisters and other family members that are like, 
find her justice, justice, justice. So they were banging on our door. With Uncle Terry, he came to Scott and Lori's home late in July 2004. By now, Lori and Scott have been married for a year. Casey's been missing for a year. And Scott's son, Justin, was just critically injured. Terry was fresh off a divorce from his wife. He had got $12,000 from the bank in Alabama and driven up to spend time with his nephew, Scott, just to get to the mountains. I'm sure at Scott's invitation, because Scott loves Uncle Terry so much, and the fact that he has a little bit of cash had nothing to do with it. Yeah, you would you would think that. I think it actually was circumstance and very unfortunate timing for Terry. Because to tell you the Terry story, I've got to go back and tell you Justin. So Justin was 10. Justin had a younger brother, Cody. But Scott, at this point, was divorced from Larissa. Scott's mom, Barb, was an insurance agent. Since she was an agent, she had policies on everybody. She even had policies on the two boys, Justin and Cody. $50,000 of life insurance on each. Two weeks before Justin's accident, Scott calls his mom and says, Mom, can we please take Larissa off the policy? This is a family policy for $50,000 on Justin. We don't need her on that. And Barb's like, well, yeah, you guys are divorced. I did get it for you and the boys. So, okay, I'll remove Larissa. Thank you. Around July 15th, 2004, Scott takes Justin outside with Cody and says, let's go fishing tomorrow. This is 10 o'clock at night. They're on their cattle property, which is about five to 10 acres. And there's a cattle grate leaning up against a pickup truck. Cattle grate probably weighs four or 500 pounds. It's all metal. He's like, let's dig for some worms. Kids go, okay. He goes, no, let me just dig with Justin. Cody, you go inside. Cody goes inside with Lori. So they're they're both in the house. Now it's just Justin and Scott out there. He goes, yeah, dig for some worms over here. And Justin starts digging. He goes, no, move over here. So he moves him right in front of the cattle crate. And Justin starts digging. We do a forensics child interview of him when I get the case, what, three years later? And all Justin remembers is a bright flash of light. And he draws that it looks like a star exploding in, in his little child drawing. But it's because the cattle grate landed on his head and severe bleeding. Scott scoops up Justin in his arms, runs screaming to the house. Lori comes out. What's happening? She sees blood just everywhere. Scott's yelling, we got to save Justin. You know, a cattle grate fell on his head. She's like, I'll call 911. Scott's like, wait, let me just take him to the hospital. That'll be faster. Scott puts him in the Jeep and starts driving up northwest to the hospital. They're on a highway. Justin says in the forensic child interview, from the flash of light in the star, doesn't remember anything until waking up in the Jeep, he looks at his left hand and he sees there's so much blood dripping down from his left hand that it's filling up the cup holder in the middle. And he says, I'm about to be sick. So I turn to the window and start trying to roll it down, but I accidentally open and unlock the door. Four years later, Justin tells the child forensic interview, I can still smell the sweat on my dad's hand as it grabs my face and starts pushing me out of the car. He goes, I try to grab onto the cup holder and the door, but my hands are bloody and I just slide right out. Now Justin doesn't remember anything again because his head hits the pavement. They're going about 50 miles an hour and brain matter goes over the side of the Jeep. No brakes, you know, marks. Scott comes back around, throws him in the Jeep, takes him to the hospital. By now, he's had two severe head injuries. Scott gets him in there. They take him to the operating table. Now you have a police officer, you have a neurosurgeon, you have medical staff. Scott is so upset, he's throwing up in a trash can. So it looks real. Crying, sobbing, save my son. Justin's unconscious. They they bring a Catholic priest in for last rites because they don't think he's going to survive. Justin regains consciousness, pops up, says to the neurosurgeon, why did my dad try to kill me? push me out of the car. Neurosurgeon turns to the cop and says, we can't take that statement. His brain's not even back in his head yet. They end up saving Justin. And Scott ends up taking a voice stress analysis test up there. Of course, passes it. It's in two jurisdictions. And he's able to manipulate a a new detective to come out and look at the cattle grate and whatever else. Scott actually throws away the cattle grate and nothing's done. Barb, the mom, instead of going to the hospital to check on her son, Justin, told me that she went to her insurance department, her little office, goes downstairs and takes Scott's name off the policy and puts her own as a beneficiary to say, I wanted to remove any further temptation from him to do anything to Justin. 
Wow. So So she was suspicious. She knew she connected it all and believed that he had tried to kill his son for the insurance. His own mother believed this. Yeah. And And did nothing else. But she had reason, right, with him taking his ex-wife off of there just before this, quote, two accidents happened in one day. Right. But she did nothing else than take Mm -hmm. him off. She didn't report her suspicions to the police or to her ex-daughter-in-law. Correct. Interesting. Well, Justin, for weeks after that, kept telling his story like a little tape recorder. Dad tried to push me out, you know, whatever else. Scott and Justin actually told the forensic interview this later. So Scott, I believe, is at a Red Lobster. Scott pulls him out of there and tells this little 11-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old at the time, and says, look, you're confused about what happened that day. I was trying to pull you in the Jeep, not out of it. If you keep saying what you're saying, we're going to have problems. Do you understand? And Justin, even though he was 10, assessed and understood, if dad did try to kill me, if what I'm thinking is true, and he's talking to me like this now, what's going to happen if I don't, quote, understand? So Justin never told the story again until we had him in the child forensic interview room. So that's why I say timing was very unfortunate for Uncle Terry. Justin spent months in Children's Hospital recovering from this. He still has issues today, 17 years later, whatever, of vision issues, et cetera, from the traumatic brain injury. Uncle Terry came when Scott failed to get $50,000 in life insurance money. Terry drives into town. He's got a briefcase. He's got a, he's got a big truck and trailer himself. He's got two dogs. And Lori's the only one that can really tell us this story because Lori's, of course, living with Scott. They're looking for Casey. She's been missing for a year. Lori said Terry was nobody's looking for him at this point <laughs> Not when he went missing because his ex-wife didn't like him, uh, et cetera. He'd alienated himself from his family, but he's sitting on their couch for basically a, a week to two week period and irritating Lori because he's doing nothing besides having that briefcase right beside him. And that's all his money from his divorce. So Lori comes home from work. She worked at a salon and the white couch that Terry had been sitting on was on the front porch. And as she comes up to see it, she sees and smells a huge pile of vomit right in the middle of the couch. And she's like, Scott, what is this? Why is this out here? That's my new couch. He goes, yeah, dogs threw up on it. She's like, that isn't dog throw up. Look at that. That's a human. That's a massive pile of vomit. And he's like, yeah, okay. Uncle Terry threw up on it. He's embarrassed about that. And he took off out of town. Where'd he go? He went to Mexico. Went to Mexico. Yeah, he actually won the Ohio State Lottery, I forgot to tell you. And he met a stripper named Ginger, and he took off to Mexico. So that's quite the day for Terry, isn't it? To throw up on the couch, you win the Ohio State Lottery, you meet a stripper named Ginger, and you move to Mexico. It's a full day. (laughs) It's a full day. So Lori thinks nothing about it. Scott throws the couch in the dumpster, or actually takes it out to the landfill, and Terry's brother, who's Scott's dad, Virgil, starts asking questions. Now, what happened to my brother? Scott engineers, and I have a copy of it, uh, had was with the FBI. It's a Yahoo address from Terry Kimball, TK44 at yahoo.com. And it's addressed to Virgil and the family. And it says, hey, family, you know, I am down here in Mexico. I've met the love of my life, Ginger. She hates visitors and we are just having the time of our lives. So we'll reach out to you next time. But just be happy for me that I've finally found the life that I always wanted. Talk to you later, Terry. And guess what? You know, like how Kimball had to separate Casey from Lori and then Casey from CB and and go through this very methodical process to alienate her and isolate her so no one would know when she disappeared that it's him. With Terry, he had already done that, unfortunately, himself. Nobody was looking for him. So that email just kind of put everybody at ease, like we don't have to look for him anymore. It's a weird story, but let's just let Terry go. And that's the last investigation anybody had done into Terry was the Yahoo email. So that's where we were sitting with Terry at the time. Did Lori at the time notice that he had all of a sudden come into a large sum of money? No, Scott always had cash on him. I saw when I got subpoenas for his bank accounts, I did see deposits of like 4,000, 5,000 and 3,000 or whatever made up Terry's money. But Scott carried around a wad of cash with him everywhere he went. And again, he was stealing from Lori's best friend. He was stealing from other inmates that had girlfriends on the outside. It it didn't matter who you were. You were losing money to Scott Kimball. That's just a blip on his radar screen. What ends up happening Jerry, is uh, we end up pulling down Scott 
when we went to California, not only did I find that sexual consent note with Mary Willis, I found two guns that Scott had been carrying around, pretending to be an FBI agent. We charged him federally for those. So that got us to where we could bring Scott down and hold him while we're doing our investigation here in Denver. And we had these meetings with him. In these meetings, Scott would be playing cat and mouse with myself, the U.S. Attorney's Office. We brought in the Boulder DA's office with the check fraud forgery. And it's like, well, how can I help you? These people are missing. And yeah, I want to be your informant. And it's just back and forth. Well, one time he told us that one of these girls might be on National Forest. And if you know Colorado, the whole middle of our state is National Forest. So it, he was pretty safe in saying that. However, Lori, Casey's mom, had given me a couple of trash bags of Scott, and I'd collected all the receipts. One of them was from a store called North Park Supers up in Walden. Well, it was where Scott had his hunting tag, so it wasn't any surprise. And I had DNA profiles out now for Leanne, Casey, Jennifer, and Terry for missing people. And the DNA profiles are sent into a database called CODIS to where nationwide, if any of these people are recovered and someone tests their DNA, it would hit off our Denver case to say, wow, we found Leanne or we found Casey. So there wasn't really a need for me to see if they'd been recovered or not because anybody that recovered them, it should have hit off my feelers that I had out through DNA. But I went ahead and called to the National Forest Service and said, hey, do you guys have anybody recovered up in Walden area? You know, we had a girl maybe go missing up there. And I said, oh, well, a hiker a year ago, almost a year ago, but it wasn't a murder or anything. I said, well, what happened to the remains from her? And they said, contact the coroner. So I contact the coroner. And the coroner says, yeah, we sent the skull down to Jefferson County, which is a uh, southwest of Denver. And then we also sent the skeletal remains to an anthropologist up in Fort Collins, but no DNA had been collected. So I'm like, this could be Casey. And Gary and I go up there, we meet the sheriff. They confirm that this hiker was up near Walden, but in a very remote area and thought to be a female, but nothing had been done. So I go down and collect the cranium and collect the skeletal system and send it all to the FBI lab. I get Lori's DNA and send that in. They do a cross-section of the femur and guess whose DNA it was? Wow. Casey's. Yeah. And it's only because Scott gave us that tiny clue of National Forest, but we had other stuff with the trash to give it some context as well. It is strange, though, that even if they thought it was just a hiker who had had an accident, that they still wouldn't have sent in her DNA to CODIS to identify who it is. This was a Jerry, a small, real small town, two person sheriff's office. They mainly deal, as they told me, they were almost apologizing. They deal with mountain lions and bear attacks and, you know, people hunting and stuff like that. The DNA thing for them was still fairly new. It was just the perfect storm of us maybe not ever identifying someone like Casey. We go up there and the place that this, it was by the grace of God that this hunter came across her because she was on the side of a hill called Dennis Hump. It's 15 miles from Walden and Walden's in the middle of nowhere. And it is up this godforsaken hunting road. And then even then, it's probably 200 yards off the road. The hunter was just working with his scope and meandering through this dense forest and just came right up on her cranium and couldn't even find his way back out, had to tie all these flags to trees to even find his way out. So we go up there and our evidence team spends three days. We recover some more skeletal remains of Casey. Her parents come up there. Rob and Lori is very emotional for them. But it's just so sad to see some a 19-year-old girl in that isolated of a space with a predator like Kimball for over a day. We couldn't imagine what that was like for her. We recover her, and that finally does turn it into a homicide case. So then we strike a deal with Scott, and we're like, okay. He, he knew it was pretty much screwed with Casey. We could finally take him to trial on something. And he says, all right, I'll, I'll trade all my other check fraud, forgery, and gun stuff, and I'll lead you to Jennifer, Leanne, and Terry, and I can do it all in one day. So Boulder County, the DAs up there, their names were Katarina Booth and Amy Akubo. They were fantastic. Putting this deal together, it's, it's unlike any deal that had ever happened before because we had to get all these other jurisdictions around Colorado and Utah to defer prosecution to them so they could be home base to have these four homicides pled through one DA's office. And those were some interesting meetings. But he pled guilty to the check fraud and the guns. 
And then the government agreed that he could serve the same sentence for four homicides, which would be a 48-year sentence. As soon as we're through with the deal, we go to a back room. He draws a little map, and he draws the Colorado line, the Utah line, I-70, and he goes, Jennifer's going to be here, and Leanne's going to be here, and Terry's going to be up on Vail Pass, and I can get you to him in one day. I start drawing up all the FBI paperwork. We start working with the Bureau of Prisons, with Department of Corrections on how we're going to check this crazy man out and get him to lead us around to these bodies. So that was quite the ops plan involving our SWAT team, our evidence response team, his defense attorneys, et cetera. We're up to the spring of 2009, and we station him out in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is right between our borders. We checked Scott out of jail. You remember the pizza thing that he did to me, you know, when we first started? Right. Demanding pizza before mm-hmm. he would answer your questions. So I show up with 40 people there ready, federal agents, state agents, everybody. We check him out of the prison, which is nothing easy. And he goes, Agent Grusing, did you brush your teeth this morning? And I'm like, oh, this is not going to end well. And I said, yes, Scott, I did. He goes, well, I didn't get to brush my teeth and we're not going anywhere until I do. And you know what it's like to check someone back into prison and then back out. That's at least a 20 to 30 minute delay. Look around at my other guys and go, he's really not going to go until he brushes his teeth. And they like roll their eyes and, okay, back in he goes. So that's how we start. And yeah, then after that, we start going on our body hunts. But that, that would be my life with Scott for the next 15 years is him asserting dominance over me for the first 15 minutes. And as long as I allow him to do that, then it's cooperation for all these other interviews. We check him out the first day. He's super confident of where Jennifer is. This is a whole thing unto itself. We do four days worth of body searches over a two-month period. And instead of getting us to Jennifer on the first day, he leads us to creek bed after creek bed. We had a fence that he's confident he went up to. It's called the Hansmeyer Ranch Gate. And there's only one gate like it north of I-70. I mean, we're way back in the what the sheriffs call the book cliff. So it's 15 miles north of I-70. You know, all these oil tanker roads. But there's one gate that he says that's what he saw this gate. He turned left and Jennifer's going to be in a creek bed on a canyon wall. But any time our evidence team would dig there and not find her, guess whose fault it was? Evidence team or Scott's? Evidence team. Yeah, you didn't dig it. No, I... It's this river, but it's going to be up higher on the cliff wall. I said that. And we're like, no, you didn't. Then they start digging again. So we would be back and forth. Leanne was supposedly 10 miles east. So that's really 30 miles of driving because these roads are bendy and windy and you're going around canyon faces. It takes us about an hour. And then he would drive us to a canyon wall where Leanne would be. He said Leanne's going to be near a waterfall. We couldn't find the right canyon that had a waterfall for him. And he would get real frustrated, start yelling at us. You're not getting me to the right place. We're like, we thought you knew the right place. It was this back and forth. We drive back. And of course, there's no Jennifer. We're back and forth between these. We had our SOG, our surveillance pilots were flying overhead to try to get us better pictures than what satellite had. It was quite the operation and a lot of finger pointing between defense attorneys and us and Scott. What was supposed to be a very productive day turned out to be drawn out. Finally, our surveillance pilots had found what he had said is kind of have a certain oil rig, possibly near this waterfall. They found something that was halfway close. And Scott said, yeah, let's go look at that. And there's just almost, Jerry, an infinite number of these little horseshoe canyons. He starts getting excited on March 11th when we're driving up to this one that our SOG pilots had found. And he tells me, hey, Grusing, I think if we find Leanne, she's going to be wrapped up in a rug and on a rock shelf. Yeah, we'll find a rug and Leanne. Like, wow, he's giving finally some detail, something that he hadn't given before. We come up there and we walk up to this waterfall. What he describes as a waterfall, it's about six feet of rock down a creek bed. We have SWAT team with me. We have two members of the SWAT team. We have his defense attorneys, me, my boss, Gary. He's like, yeah, that's a waterfall. I look down there, there's a bone. The sheriff said that looks like a sheep bone. We had seen a lot of cattle and sheep out there. After Scott points to the bone, he goes, "Eh, I don't think this is right. Let's start walking back the other way. I couldn't tell you for sure why today, but instead of going with Scott, Jerry, I started walking up that canyon wall from where the bone was and just kept going. It took me about five minutes and I came up on a rock slide. And by the rock slide, there is a gray hair clip with brown and blonde hair coming out of it. 
I told you that there were other pictures on Kimball's computer. One was of Leanne with her hair dyed. Leanne was the one who was going to help her, quote, husband, Steve Hawley, escape from prison. Leanne only knew Scott by the name of Hannibal. And Leanne's car was pretty close. It was 11 miles away from where this canyon was. So when I saw the hair clip and I saw the brown and blonde hair, I knew it had to be her. So I yelled, I think I found her. Scott and my SWAT team guys and Phil come back up around and Scott's standing up above me once they find me. He's looking down on me and he goes, that's not her. I'm like, who else is going to be out here, Scott? <laughs> you set a waterfall or whatever. He goes, that's not her. Let's keep moving. And Jerry, he had just a blank expression on his face. There was no surprise, no anger, no happiness. It's just blank. It creeped out all of us. Phil said, get him out of here. He looks weird. It's not word for word, but I think Phil said something like that. They marched Scott back down. We're able to see other bones at this point, and they're not shaped like sheep bones. They have what we as humans have with our joints and the way that our arms work and stuff like that. It's more circular at the end instead of spherical shaped. We're pretty sure it's her. We call the coroner out, and the coroner spends a day to unearth Leanne, and it's her. We sent the bones in to confirm, but almost the full skeleton with a forty caliber spent round where her head would have been. We never recover the head. So, yeah, we found Leanne, but he was taking us up very close to where she was, turning around and walking the other way. And since then, he's told other inmates that that's what he was doing with Jennifer, basically. We never did find Jennifer. We flew her parents out. We made that a memorial with Leanne. We flew Leanne's parents, Darlene and Howard, out, and we had a grave site with them months later. But we kept going back to that canyon with Jennifer. He kept playing games to the point to where we caught him in a couple of very obvious contradictions. And we said, we're done. We explained to the judge what he had told some other inmates, that he was just jerking our chain, having a great time doing it. We explained how we found Leanne, that it wasn't even that he took us there. He took us very close. It seemed to be yet another con. Jerry, he had every incentive to take us there. He could have been serving even today a 48-year sentence dating back to 2003, serve maybe 24. What's really scary is you said 24 years to 2003. He could be getting out in 2027, but because he violated the terms of the agreement, the judge hitting was 70 years. It's either that or go to trial on Leanne, Casey, Jennifer, and Terry. So none of the other bodies were recovered, not the uncle, not Casey, not Jennifer, just Leanne? After we recovered Leanne, the DAs, they threatened him. It wasn't an outright threat, but it's like, okay, you're playing games with us. You won't take us to Jennifer. At least give us Uncle Terry. Jerry, he drew us a map to Terry that he could have drawn blindfolded to Jennifer. And this map, I've shown it to forensic students and whatever. It's better than most Google Earth maps. He probably had some help from looking at something, but he drew it from Vail Pass. It's a logging road that heads southwest, and it winds and bends. It's called switchbacks up this side of this mountain. And he even draws where clearings are. He draws a tree. He says, your tree will be 40 feet off the road on the west side. And he says, you will find a tarp, you'll find rope, and you'll find Uncle Terry in his Walmart jeans, his short sleeve t-shirt, his glasses, all the way down to his belt and everything. We used his hand-drawn map to find Terry in the middle of nowhere once the snow melted. So we found him July of that year, late June, July. We walked right to him. And there was a bullet in the back of his head, same caliber, came from the same gun as Leanne. And that's that same gun that I'd recovered. It's a 40 caliber Firestar semi-automatic handgun. Same gun that killed Leanne, killed Terry. And it was still lodged right below his left orbital and his left cheek around itself. So Terry had been shot in the back of his head, most likely on that couch. We went back to the house where Lori had said the couch had been. You remember he moved it out front with the vomit on there? Where that couch had been, nothing was on the carpet. We pulled back the rug. Underneath the rug, both soaked through the pad and onto the subfloor, was about a 10-inch diameter pool of blood. So he had just scrubbed it off the top. Right in his own living room, though, he killed his uncle. And then just moved the couch out front, scrubbed the top off the carpet, and they lived there for another year. (laughs) Wow. Right on top of where he killed Uncle Terry. Wow. So he was lucky that no blood got on the couch. Mm -hmm. Or he scrubbed it off. Scott was, by now, I think he was very accomplished at doing this. So Scott was sentenced to the 70 years. But after that, I wasn't done with Kimball. 
In working this case, there's another prostitute. Her name's Katrina Powell, who in October 2004, she was found with her hands missing, cuts, her breasts and her vagina had been sliced open, basically, surgically, and she had been beaten multiple ways, probably with a hammer, a claw hammer, strangled, killed about five different ways. She was left in the middle of a back parking lot up in a town called Westminster, almost displayed. Once Kimball started making the paper as a serial killer, they had had Westminster police had worked it really hard for a couple of years. They had no leads. But once Kimball came on our screen, and especially working through recovery of these bodies as Kimball was talking to other cellmates, he was bragging about a prostitute that he had killed. And he didn't give it word for word, but the stuff that he said would basically match the crime scene of Katrina Powell. We could never get enough to charge him with it. And the DA was rightfully hesitant because there's no DNA on her. She was actually bathed in what would be an acid sort of thing. So there's no DNA. There's cases like Katrina. That one made the paper, which is why I'm talking about it. Other ones going back even to the late 80s and early 90s to where our VICAP unit, which that's our violent criminal and apprehensive unit, our profiling unit, helped me with a very comprehensive timeline of Scott where he was and when people would either most likely get killed. It's really hard to see when they would disappear, but where they're recovered. I just started working those cases in the periphery. But I brought the profilers out with me to talk to Scott in 2011. And all he could talk about was how he was sexually abused as a child and how women loved him. He was so excited to have the profilers come. But he did talk a lot about how diligent he was with his crime scene cleanup with Casey, Jennifer, Leanne, and Terry. And it is impressive. The links he would go to, wet wipe himself down, put that in one bag, take the victim's clothes, put that in another bag, drop one off in one place, drop it off in another. He would also do misdirection after each one of their deaths. With Casey, he kept the necklace that CB gave her and he would drape it around Casey's door a month later and tell Lori, look, Casey must have been here. There's her necklace. And she's like, what? That is her necklace. That's what CB promised her. And so then they would think she's still alive or maybe she's playing games with them or something. And he would do the same with Jennifer's phone. That was the Utah thing of dialing numbers when it wasn't Jennifer. And with Uncle Terry, it was the Yahoo email going back to the family. But he would make one of his victims seem alive at least a couple of days, sometimes a week longer. So it makes it really hard to figure out when they actually disappeared. Myself and two of the profilers spent 14 hours with Scott in one day. And he's basically talking about how smart he is and how much of a victim he is. He would talk in stories or allegories of these other victims, like talking about blue cars versus red cars. He was very hesitant to talk about anything we couldn't prove. After the profilers go back, he calls me back down to his prison, sends me a letter and says, all right, Grusing, let's come talk. I'll tell you everything. I take my boss Phil down there with me. He goes, all right, I'm going to tell you about 21 people I killed, but you can't record it. I can't have an attorney. You can't charge me with any of these things. This is just between me and you. So, okay. He tells me about the names, not the specific dates, but the months. He had us bring down these big, what we call MAPSCO books. And he goes, you can turn to the page, but I'll tell you exactly where I killed someone and then where I took them afterwards. And so say one was Devil's Reservoir in Utah. He goes, I found a hitchhiker named Jeff. I parked south of Devil's Reservoir. You'll see if you go around the south part, there's this little barbed wire fence. I went through that and I dumped him right inside the barbed wire fence on the east side of the lake. So you'll find Jeff there. And like, okay. And as we're looking at the maps, he's describing it to a T. We would go on to another one and another one. For him, it's hitchhikers primarily, starting in like the late 80s, going up through 2004, 2005. And he told us of 21 of those, mostly hitchhikers, some prostitutes, but mainly men. I stopped him a couple of times and said, Scott, I think you're jerking my chain a little bit. I don't know what the purpose of this is, why you would all of a sudden tell me. He goes, just listen. And like, okay. I said, all right, well, I'll go research these at the end and we'll get back with you. Jerry, I'll have you guess how many of those 21 that he gave me detail, place, time, et cetera, how many of those were true? I can't even guess. I want to say 21, and then I also want to say none of them. Your second answer is correct. B, <laughs> none. I called every jurisdiction, though, and they did diligent research. We didn't find one body where he said it would be, not even a missing person, et cetera. 
It's not the same type of death each time either. Some he shot with bow and arrows. Some he would shoot in the back of the head. Some he would shoot with a shotgun. Others he would strangle. I go back to Scott and say, all right, Scott, I told you, I get paid the same. Whether you, I come up with one of these victims or none, but I don't know why you put me on this fool's errand. He goes, John, he called me John. He goes, John, what I told you is true. This is a puzzle and you've got to figure it out. These aren't their real names or what happened. How would you feel, Jerry, if that was you? Like somebody was jerking my chain. <laughs> and he had been jerking it by now. This is 2011. I'd spent quite a few years with him. But yeah, I do think that there was a truth to every one of those. So you believe that he did kill 21 other people, but when, where, who, mm -hmm. you don't know. Yeah, and that goes along. That's pretty close to the number, Jerry, that our VICAP unit came up with on unsolved homicides that happened in Montana, Idaho, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, that whole area that he was, that's his hunting ground. So from 2011 to 2014, I was to and from with him, and he was just playing cat and mouse with me, like Katrina Powell, like a guy named Joseph Bowen in Montana, who I believe he stabbed to death. Then there's another woman in Utah that was left in a rug on a rock shelf, just like he said Leanne was. I found that through Vicap. And he would play cat and mouse with me, like, yeah, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. Grusing, that sounds pretty good. You might put a question mark beside that one. Let's talk about that next time. So it's this quid pro quo stuff, just like in Silence of the Lambs with Hannibal Lecter. And I felt like Clarice Starling about half the time coming before him. In 2014, after playing cat and mouse with him, he got an attorney and said, all right, now I'll make it legitimate. I'll come clean. We would ferry him to and from the jail to our FBI office. The attorney would meet with him. I would help them with research. They wouldn't tell me who, but they would tell me on their progress. The attorney, finally, they would be like, we're up to 20, we're up to 30, we're up to 40. And when it was between 40 and 50, she and her investigator said, we're going to walk him into the death penalty. We cannot represent him anymore. But we were going to do this global deal that finally solved all the stuff that Kimball was good for. They felt that what he was telling them was legitimate. Their job is to represent their client and protect their client's interests. And they felt that if they brought the actual stuff that Kimball did to us, that he might get sentenced to death. That's what they said. They said that we can't walk him into a death penalty. We're trying to look out for his best interests. And he just keeps on going. And so they walked away. To this day, I never know what homicides he told them. I was helping them research and like where he was in 87 or where he was in 91 or those sorts of things. Afterwards, he tried to meet with me and a district attorney who were involved in his homicide charges, the original ones, but he just gave us BS things. These people in Utah and Nevada that died, but we could tell right away he was just jerking our chain. He's told multiple inmates over the years, and again, he loved to play with inmates just like he loved to play with me, but he's been consistent with inmates on a 17 number. With me and Phil, it was the 21, and then with his attorneys, it's between 40 and 50. But Jerry, if you look at the very small picture with what he did with Leanne and Jennifer within one month of being released, that he's spinning, he's got the FBI involved. Jennifer is about to disappear. Leanne is already disappearing. And he's telling multiple stories to everybody. And they disappear without a freaking trace. Nobody even knows they're gone. That's not his first rodeo, <laughs> you know. It would be a whole different thing of the, my research into VICAP and getting those police reports and Scott twin around with me on all those. My time with Scott basically ended in 2018 and 2019 when he did hire an inmate who was being released and he told him he had a million dollars buried at a fence post in Montana. If you get me and Mark, Mark was his cellmate out of jail, I will share that million dollars with you. And the inmate, I'll call him Billy because he cooperated with this. Billy was a lifer. He had been in for trying to kill people before. He was going to be 60 years old getting out. He didn't have a future. And Kimball, like I said, he assesses people so well. He knew that Billy didn't have much to live for. Billy's like, okay, how's this going to work? He's like, okay, here's what you do. The facility that Kimball was in, it's called Sterling Correctional Facility. It's one of the higher maximum state facilities here in Colorado. It's got a lethal fence around it. The inner layer is not lethal. The outer layer is lethal as far as the electricity on the fence. Because of that, they don't have the real high, tall guard towers with guns in them. This tried to happen like 20 years ago. Someone tried to fly a helicopter in and rescue an inmate. It didn't quite work. 
But that's Kimball's ploy with Billy. He's like, look, you go kill. And this is Lori. By now, we've recovered Casey. We've had Casey's funeral. Uh, Lori has suffered some severe PTSD from marrying the guy that killed her daughter. She's still struggling. This is years and years later, 16 years after Casey died and 10 years after we buried her, et cetera, or 13 years. She's living with a guy called Brian, and Brian is just a saint. He's been providing Lori with companionship. Brian had also lost all his life savings to Scott multiple times, lost a vehicle to Scott. Scott had stolen from Brian over and over again because he's a trusting soul. So you kind of had two people that uh, knew Scott well. Brian was a hard worker and still had money. Scott said he knew Brian's address. He knew where Brian kept his money. He knew that Brian had a gun at home, et cetera. He's like, here's what you do. You go steal first from Mark's dad, Mark's his other cellmate, and Mark had guns as well. Then you go to Brian's house. You tie up Brian. You threaten to kill him. And Brian, he said, he'll turn over. He goes, all you need is his social security number because you steal his credit card. You get a social security number and date of birth. You can be Brian. You'll have to cut off your beard, go to a helicopter place, and then say, I need to rent a helicopter for a day. He goes, it'll be five, 600 bucks, which is what it was. I called the helicopter place. And then he said, you need to fly out to Sterling and say, you're going to look at some cattle. As soon as you get in the air, you hijack the helicopter pilot because they don't check for guns or anything, which they didn't before, Jerry, but they do now after I've talked with them because it's a private helicopter company. They charge five or 600 bucks an hour. And he goes, and then you would just fly to Sterling to look for cattle. We will be ready to go. He'll be at gunpoint. You have him at gunpoint and you make him land in the yard and then we'll jump on the helicopter and you'll fly us to a car that'll be waiting. And then off we go. Billy was going to do this for them until his sister called DEA, who called me, and we sat down Billy and said, there is no million dollars, but if we are able to hang an escape charge, attempted escape, and maybe possibly homicide on Kimball, he'll never get out of prison. I call it pixie dust, and it's that people like Billy tend to believe Scott just like we did as the FBI. Once we wiped that out of his eyes, he became an excellent cooperator. We did 11 recorded phone calls between Billy, Mark, and Kimball. And it's all about, quote, looking at cattle, which was code for escaping from prison. We pretended like Billy rented the helicopter. We pretended like he killed Brian and Mark's father, just like happened. But over the phone, he would say, like, it's done. And they would just go, good, let's move on. Let's get that cattle call going. And we actually had uh, Kimball and Mark dressed in multiple layers of clothes waiting on that field inside of the prison. And we have them on camera looking to the west where this helicopter would come and waiting and waiting. Jerry, I really wanted to have someone fly a helicopter over there, <laughs> but my boss wouldn't let me do it. The prison wouldn't let me do it, you know, just to enact it and even catch them more in their scheme, just because who knows if Kimball would have killed some guard trying to get to it or something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But uh, we were able to convict him and Mark of the attempted escape. That hurt my relationship with Scott for about another year or two. But just before I retired, he was willing to trade a couple more homicides. And at that point, I'm like, I'm done. He had talked about the one in Montana and one in Alaska that he thought were basically throwaways, homeless people. But I couldn't, I wasn't going to involve a DA and stuff at that point. I retired in July 2021. Hadn't spoken with Scott since. My wife is super happy that, as she calls my work wife, Scott Kimball, and I have broken up. Life is good for me. Wow. What a case review. I mean, there's so many twists and turns, and it's just amazing. I do have to ask the question of what happened with Carl, because I know, because I read all, the, and there's so many articles and videos about this case. The fact that he was operating an informant that turned out to be a serial killer was not something that anybody would have thought, but how did he fare? The FBI headquarters did some investigations into it, obviously, when an informant of ours is a serial killer. And even FBI Alaska didn't know who they were dealing with at the time. And I was interviewed a couple of times over, Carl should have done this, Carl should have done that. And I'm like, Look, you guys do what you need to do. I am just so grateful that I wasn't the one alone with Scott when all these plates were spinning and all this pixie dust was flying in the air. I'd like to think I would have done things differently, but it's so unfair for me to have all the dust to settle and me to look at this case objectively with Scott in prison instead of Scott in front of me. 
So yeah, there were some internal investigations and whatever, but I tried to stay as apart from that as possible and just let them do their thing with Carl and try to learn humbly whatever lesson I could and just be grateful I wasn't in Carl's position. My understanding is that he ended up being suspended for a couple of weeks, but he continued with his career. Correct. All right. Well, thank you so much for that great case review. Talking about careers, I want to ask you my standard question, which is when and why you joined the FBI. Yeah, very good. I was in Lubbock, Texas, at Texas Tech University. I was getting my master's degree in business, went to a career fair, saw an FBI desk, and I had never thought about it. I thought my career was just going to be boring business, and then I get to play basketball afterwards, which is what I love to do. I still do it today. I call it old man basketball now because it doesn't look like the basketball I played in my 20s. But (laughs) I met the agent there and I was just fascinated. His name's Greg. He was out of San Antonio. Greg had been in 10 years and Greg told me two things which are true. He goes, you won't be a multimillionaire, which that's true, but your days every day will be different and you'll love what you do. And he goes, that's true. I talk about, since I worked not only Kimball, I worked some other cases like him, and I get to go talk to forensics classes around Denver area. And I say, I hope that you guys and girls can find a job that is as engaging as what I had with the FBI, because I worked for them for 25 years, but on the out, it looks like six or seven is what it felt like. It just went by so fast. And I'm sure you can attest to that as well, Jerry. I loved what I did and was sad that, you know, it kind of had to come to an end, but it was time to start something new. But that's how I got started was a career fair with Greg. And then I processed out of Dallas got assigned to Denver, worked terrorism for a year and a half before they put me on the violent crime squad. And I would have never thought violent crime would be my calling because I was business background, but I just loved working that and was really engaged in it. And I loved treating people well, like even Scott. They're not used to law enforcement treating them well. They're used to being interrogated. And I loved the interview, which is a lot different than an interrogation. It's more collaborative. Scott, I would say, is a 10 on the narcissism, on the manipulation, on the evil deviousness, but I could apply the things that I learned from him to other people that did awful things, but they hated what they did, were able to get them to look at that objectively in themselves. So you've been retired now for a year. Yes. How did you transition those violent crime skills and the interview skills that you gained during your FBI career? What are you doing now? I am the director of security for Douglas County Schools, which is south of Denver. We have 88 schools, 64,000 students, and I help with our mental health unit, with our principles of assessing threats and dealing with threats. We're also keeping our buildings safe, but I'm working not only with this school district, but in others, and still some with our behavior analysis unit because they take a vested interest. Our behavior analysis unit, one, deals with threats and especially threats to schools, houses of worship, et cetera. Working in that prevention mode, Jerry, all this criminal activity of seeing the the end of the scale on when someone goes down a violent pathway and is not interrupted in that violent pathway, but ends up committing whatever violent act that is, could be murder, could be self-harm, could be all these other things. Working with the profiling unit, that's really helped me transition to, I think, being more effective and proactive in this sort of capacity. Very interesting. Well, your whole case review has been fascinating. And I know there is another murder case that you investigated during your career that I think everyone would also be very interested in hearing about. So I hope to have you come back in uh, 2023 and give us that case review. But for now, I want to give you the chance to have the last word. What would you like to say? As far as the lesson learned from Scott Kempel is, and I hope investigators can take this away, because it was a hard one for me to learn, is it's not about you. And that goes to the pizza. It goes to the brushing the teeth. It goes to the 15 minutes worth of beatdown that I would get every time I spoke with him. It was very humbling because it was hard to take a lot of times that I'd have an investigator look at me because it would be a different investigator. Once he got to be infamous, people were trying to solve their homicides through him and they'd come sit by me and go, how can you take that? Like, well, it's not really about me. It's Scott needing to assert his dominance. And once I get through that, we're going to learn something. 
out of all the traits, I think narcissism is probably the most dangerous because I've seen narcissism in a lot of these domestic cases where when you insult a narcissist, it can be a death sentence. And it's someone who doesn't normally commit violent acts. In dealing with Scott close up, I saw what you have to do to deal with the narcissist to even get past 15 minutes. The narcissistic principle or dealing with someone who is so full of pride that they don't value other people at all. I think we all have some sort of narcissism, Jerry, and I try to check that in myself daily when I come to work. How much is this about me? But when I see Scott and he allowed it to go from zero to 100 and that other people's lives was worth actually zero, not worth 1% or 10%, but he became so narcissistic that he couldn't even see his own son as his son or his uncle as his uncle. It was scary to see that. I can see traces of that, not only in other people, but in myself. It causes you, if you really look at that, to have some sort of humility and self-assessment. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there is a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com, where you'll find a photo of Johnny Grusing, links to news articles about this case, several photos from the many searches to find the bodies of Scott Kimmel's victims. There's even a copy of Kimmel's creepy contract to submit to bondage and sexual torture. There are also links to where you can listen to more FBI retired case file review episodes featuring serial murder and serial killers. Don't forget to print out your giveaway copy of the physical surveillance puzzle page from my FBI word search puzzle book. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.